Hello and welcome to Liberty Law Talk. I'm your host, Richard Reinch. Liberty Law Talk is featured at the online journal Law and Liberty, which is available at lawliberty.org. Welcome to Liberty Law Talk. I'm Richard Reinch. Today we're talking with Scott Yenner about his new book, The Recovery of Family Life. Scott Yenner is professor of political science at Boise State University, and he is the Washington Fellow at the Claremont Institute's Center for the American Way of Life. He's the author of several books on the family and is also a frequent contributor to Law and Liberty. So, Scott, we're glad to have you on the program. Thanks for having me, Richard. It's my pleasure. So, The Recovery of Family Life, the full title, Exposing the Limits of Modern Ideologies. What's going on in the recovery of family life? Well, the, the book is divided into three sections. And uh, the first section is really on what those powerful modern ideologies are that are undermining family life. I identify modern feminism, contemporary liberalism, and sexual liberation theories as really powerful ideologies that are shaping the way young people, and even now by the, by the time we are middle-aged people, think about their lives, about themselves, about sex, and the attitudes that are cultivated by those ideologies make it very difficult for people to imagine married life, to live responsible family life, to cultivate character in their children, sometimes even to have children. Uh, All of these basic things that we took for granted that a civilization needs can no longer be taken for granted. And these ideologies are the reason for that, I would say. Why we think about the modern liberal state, which under its official ideology, it's going to leave us alone largely to pursue our own different, you know, visions or things we want to do or what we think is good. It's going to leave us alone. Why should the modern liberal state concern itself with the family? Isn't that just something private? I mean, does the law really care about family? Should it? Yeah, I mean, I think that no matter what happens, the state is in some way concerned about the family. And it takes an official stance of neutrality, but it's always legislating a kind of morality. Let me try to illustrate that with an example. I think the best example of that is obscenity law. It used to be that the state prevented the circulation of obscenity because it was worried about how exposure to Obscenity would cultivate kinds of character, kinds of states of mind in people, point them away from marital life. And that was the justification for limiting the circulation of obscenity. But now that we've gotten rid of all those limits, the state is officially neutral. You can watch pornography or you can choose not to watch pornography. But the circulation, the mass circulation, of pornography makes it more desirable, more available. It appeals to something that's deep within us. And therefore, the removal of restraints and the official stance of neutrality has done a lot to, I would say, pornify, if you want to say that, uh, the culture and to shape the minds of men and women when it comes to how the relationships will go. So it's true that you can choose not to watch pornography, but it's also true that by removing those restraints, the official stance of the culture has uh, become much more open to it. And there's, you know, ever increasing uh, venues for both making and viewing it. And uh, there's more public acceptance of it. Uh, You could use other examples in the same way. But now with, with regard to the family, I'm trying to think about things that developed you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago, you know, my understanding uh, and talking to, I mean, I had a conversation with an older lawyer when I was just starting practicing and he had actually had been involved in marriage cases under the old, you know, fault-based standard for divorce and had defended people against becoming divorced and trying to prove that fault had not occurred. And I, I, you know, think about that, but, you know, my understanding is, that was sort of thrown out because the courts were flubbing it because they had so many people who wanted divorces. And so basically the people 
largely wanted this in terms of maybe the first wave of how America changed the public law regarding marriage, that this was sort of a response to the democratic demand. And I guess one question to you is, was there just something about the way we did things in the past that people found oppressive? Yeah, I think they found it oppressive. However, their view of what was oppressive was shaped itself by the culture that they were in. And I think what the example that you're using of divorce is an excellent example of that, because I think it's a two-way street. If you change the law, you're doing that partly in response to popular demands in a democracy for changing the law. And then once you change the law, you shape the way people think about those experiences. So no doubt, many more people wanted to get out of marriages by the 1970s. And this was perhaps a reflection of a change made 50 years earlier in marriage law, and uh, which unsettled marriage. And that change in the law rebounded and then shaped the way people approached marriage and approached their experience within marriage. Uh, we often just focus on that first angle or that first part of the relationship, the way that our laws reflect popular opinion, and we neglect the ways in which law shapes public opinion. And that's really what I try to emphasize in the book, and I think this is the classical approach to understanding how the laws shape the minds, the cultures, our view of advantageous, good, and just on family matters. Thinking about the descriptions that you have in the book of these different, you say, ideologies, and I, I think about also anthropology as well. Talk about this, you call it the rolling revolution. Does the rolling revolution, does it necessarily aim at the destruction of the family or, or what's going on there? So first of all, what is the rolling revolution? What I try to do is show how each of these three ideologies, but especially the ideology of feminism and sexual liberation theory, have posited for themselves a goal. Uh, the goal of feminism is to get beyond gender so that no one's life is affected by their sex and no expectation about how you live would be determined by your being a man or a woman. And sexual liberation theory wants to get us beyond repression. And repression is kind of a reflection of our desire to have some things about our lives, our sexual lives, be private and pointed toward love and community. And the changes that have been wrought by these ideologies have been toward those goals. And feminism and sexual liberation theory are trying to erase really important parts of human nature that are very difficult to erase so that they have to keep doing more and more reforms. It's an endless, almost infinite uh, aspiration that they have set for themselves. And since it can't be achieved, it always has more work to do. And the family, I would say, is collateral damage on the way toward achieving those goals. Married life and family life really have a lot to do with sexual restraint. And if you're going to achieve a culture that is beyond repression, you're going to have to get rid of expectations that men and women will be faithful to one another in marriage, that they will produce children, that sex is related to procreation. You're going to have to roll over those expectations. So the, the family and married life are collateral damage in the achievement of the goals that these ideologies have set for themselves. Many people, women who call themselves feminists would, I think like listening to your description would say, I don't know if that's what I'm aiming at. I just want, you know, opportunities in the workplace to be treated according to my work, to not have double standards. And it is the case they can look back and point to history where women were treated not just differently, but oppressed under, quote, the old regime. How do you respond to that? I do think that those things are true, that is, many women think of feminism simply in terms of expanding opportunities or ending discrimination. And the general ideology of feminism wants to sell their ideology on a level that is acceptable to many people. What I call that in the book is retail feminism. 
And the goal is choice, they say, or opportunity, they say. But the, the difficulty is when you get down to brass tacks, how do you know when choice has been accomplished? And the, the deeper feminist thinkers deal with these questions. And they say that you can only know that women are freely choosing when they choose exactly the same as men, that the world has to be 50 50, that we would consider it to be an injustice if there were not 50% of the women being CEOs. They never say 50% of the plumbers have to be women, but 50% of the engineers need to be women. So the high status jobs need to be divided equally among the sexes. Choice is something that can be justified on liberal grounds. But understanding when choice, so-called, is achieved takes the feminists beyond liberalism toward uh, a, a kind of social engineering angle that becomes really necessary for feminism. So I think it's one of the great successes of feminism that they've sold their ideology in terms that are broader than their actual aims. And they've achieved a great political success as a result of that way of framing it. But when you get underneath it, you realize that it's a much deeper, more radical agenda that requires the remaking of an entire culture. Yeah, I mean, as, as I was listening and thinking about your argument, Scandinavian countries come to mind, Sweden comes to mind, where, to my knowledge, I, I think it's Sweden where like parliament, I think, has to, their, their legislative chamber has to have a certain number of women I think they mandated uh, representation on boards has to have a certain number of women, uh, corporate boards. And that seems to be kind of what the situation you're describing. When I think about this ideology working in American life, do we see it that way? And do we see it impacting, say, the state and the family in sort of an ideological way? Thinking about also family dissolution, is that feminist ideology working in a lot of these cases or is it? something else, a lot of other things going on. Uh, what do you say? I think feminism works itself out more in the failure of families to form than it does in compromising families that do form. So I think it does uh, have effects there. So I think the way I would uh, respond to that is that feminism teaches women that a career-oriented life is the most fulfilling life. And it recognizes, or I say, I stigmatizes those who would be, quote, you know, mere mothers or only mothers or just a mother. And therefore, it judges itself based on the extent to which women are career oriented. And I should say, therefore, again, evaluates institutions based on whether or not they have achieved a kind of balance between men and women. We see that the more career oriented women are, the less likely. They are to enter into marriage early and to enter into marriage at all. The younger generations we see, uh, the predictions are that about 40% of the people who are now under 40 will never marry. And I think feminism considers that a great achievement because people are prioritizing other aspects of their identity over being mothers or wives or fathers and husbands. And that is precisely where the ruling revolution, as feminists articulate it, want to take human beings. So I think the Swedish example is a good example, because there you have fewer families forming and a, a great career orientation among the women. Within the modern liberal state, because like I don't see in America, you can correct me, I know you know public policy better than, my, than I do. I don't see like the government so much directing outcomes according to this particular ideology. And if, in fact, it is the case that women are making these choices, I mean, isn't that just something we live with? So I, I do think the government is really involved in that. The way we treat education is a governmental matter. And the emphasis in all of our education toward career orientation, as opposed to what it looked like probably 60, 70 years ago, where there were some assumed sex differences in education because there was assumed sex differences in future life roles. And after you do that for a few generations, uh, there's actually no one left who will sit there and talk about how there's an expectation that men and women will do different things in their lives in order to live complementary lives with one another. 
So uh, there's also anti-discrimination laws. One of the rages right now on universities is trying to increase the number of women in STEM fields because they're thought to be underrepresented. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, I think violations of anti-discrimination laws in those scholarships and recruitment programs because there's an aim toward getting, you know, 30% women in engineering. And then after 30%, it'll be 35% to try to ratchet it up. So I think there are a lot of ways in which government promotes careerism. But the broader point that you're making, I think I agree with, is that there is a reflection of culture in all of this. The feminist you know, way of thinking, the way of imagining what a woman and a man should be has been very successful in cultivating the attitudes and the state of mind of young people, and as I say now, middle-aged people at this point. And because of that, whenever there's a disparity between men and women in a particular institution, people are embarrassed by it. Uh, whenever there's not a woman on the faculty, it's thought to be a problem just in itself. So th there's no doubt it's a powerful culture uh, but I want to always emphasize that I think the culture has been built, at least in part, through laws and tensions in order to reshape it. You know, one of the interesting things about uh, Charles Murray's book, Coming Apart, and has been sort of the you know, source of a lot of interesting commentary, is how put together upper middle class families are. And I would just venture, you know, many of those are going to be two earner households. And, you know, then Murray points out, but, you know, family life gets less stable, less married to two parents, the more you go down the income distribution scale. So, you know, middle class and then, then working class, things really start to drop off. But I would just, you know, I would think my experience in higher education, working with a lot of academics, to the extent, you know, you're going to have women who really think of themselves in this capacity. They actually maybe have, actually are working and having, you know, strong families, stable families. Have you thought about that, like that sort of an interesting disconnect? Yeah, I mean, there's two Americas when it comes to marriage. And so the upper class marriage that Murray uh, describes in the Belmont of America, you know, it's uh, what Robert Putnam calls the neo traditional marriage. The neo traditional marriage, you know, there's probably a lot of sex before marriage. It happens later, it happens after careers have been established for men and women. But after they are married to one another, they stay married, they raise children, the children are responsible. It, it's almost the exact same, you know, stats when you look at the extent to which marriages stay together now as it was in 1980 among the upper 20 percent. And then when you look at the lower 80 percent in America, and I imagine this as the problem of rural America and the problem of urban America, where you see uh, the marriage rates are you know, a third of what they were in 1980. About 25% of people will get and stay married in the rural whites and urban blacks in America. And this is the failure to form problem. So how do we account for that? How do we account for the fact that marriage has really been destroyed in communities among the lower, you know, more than half of the population? My answer to that is that the upper class doesn't enforce any kind of morality or sex roles for the lower classes, so that there's no no one is prepared to be a wife or a husband in their education, in the expectations that people have for them, and therefore we shouldn't be surprised that no one is actually fit for it. The uh, examples have been erased. The education that one would uh, expect to point people toward uh, family life no longer does. There's no official teaching about what a proper role of a man is and what a proper role of a woman is. W without those proper roles being taught, men and women are kind of lost at sea, especially in the lower classes. So, you know, these people are not genuinely feminist. The women of the lower classes are not feminists. They don't study Susan Muller Oaken and Betty Friedan, <laughs> but they live downstream from feminism. And living downstream from feminism means that they live in a culture without expectations for what men and women should be. And as religious practice declines among the lower classes, as the idea of sex roles declines among the lower classes, what we're getting is the kind of uh, two different kinds of men, kind of either hyper-masculine gang members 
or men who retreat into themselves and spend a lot of time uh, playing video games and watching pornography. And we're getting women who want to be independent, but therefore don't know how to attract and keep men around. Yeah. And so it's a huge problem in the lower class, but I would say it's caused by our official ideology. You know, the, the men is interesting. The data that I've read, 25% of prime working age men in this country do not work, which is a depression, Great Depression type statistic. And there's not a lot of thought about that. I mean, there are people who write about it, but that is a striking number. What do you make of that? Yeah. And what I make of it is that when you don't expect men to be providers, if you don't give men a purpose for their ambition, for their work, if you don't give them something to sacrifice toward, they are purposeless people. And one of the things that over the course of human life that people have always aspired to do is marry, have children, be responsible for them. If you destroy that particular ambition, well, what are the men supposed to provide for? What are they supposed to channel their ambition for? How are they supposed to understand the sacrifices that they're willing to make for something outside of themselves? So I think one of the great crimes of feminism is to stigmatize the idea that the most loving expression of male life, the desire to provide, is actually an expression of tyranny. And that has just effects downstream of feminism. And that's the problem we see in both rural and urban America. One of the reasons why I wanted to interview you is looking at virtually every country in the West. It's striking to me. I know it's striking to you that I don't think there's one that actually has a replacement level birth rate. There might be one or two. Israel is the only one. Israel has above, right? I mean, they're like three. Yeah. Yeah. Three children per family or. And, you know, Jonathan Last, formerly of the Weekly Standard, now editor of The Bulwark, wrote a book about this maybe six or seven years ago and describing it not just as a Western, but a worldwide phenomenon of flagging birth rates. When we think about the flagging birth rates, to me, that's just a big signal that there's problems in the moral ecology, social, cultural ecology of Western countries. But to the extent there's reflection and thinking about it, it's, well, government should give people more money and more resources. And you wrote a piece on this recently for Law and Liberty in which you didn't think that was necessarily going to do much. What do we know about those policies just in terms of trying to deal with this problem, which to me indicates you're on to something and thinking about the lack of family formation? Yeah, I mean, many countries have these policies now, and they seem to have a marginal short-term benefit. Hungary has adopted, I think, the most generous policy on these matters, and uh, its birth rate, you know, skyrocketed from something like 1.2 to 1.35, and conservatives uh, all across America took this as evidence that we need a family policy and uh, rallied behind Mitt Romney's child assistance program. And I'm not opposed to the child assistance program, but I just think we have to have genuine expectations for what any of these programs can do. The decision to have children is not an economic decision. It's a decision that is shaped by what is honored in a political community and how much hope the human beings have for the health of their political community and their own lives. If people have no faith in the future, if people do not trust any of the institutions of government, if they don't trust churches or schools, if they think the country is headed in the wrong direction, all of these things are just indicators that they don't have hope for the future of their country, and therefore they are less likely to have children. Another point is if a political community doesn't honor having children, it doesn't consider it part of a good life, a genuine narrative of what contributes to a good life, uh, there's going to be fewer people marrying and staying married. And these factors are much more crucial than the marginal economic benefits that you can get from child assistance programs. When I wrote that piece for you, I got a picture from someone sent to me by email, which was of a very impoverished Nebraska family uh, living in a dirt hut with kind of corn stalks as their roof. And they were standing outside of this, and there were 13 children and a mother and a father. And I don't think they were asking for the child assistance program. 
And they weren't because the family life was honored and there was a lot of hope uh, in the country. And this was probably something like 1880, that the best days of the country were in front of it. And so I think the birth rates are genuinely a crisis of confidence in civilization and an indication that marriage and family life are not honored in that civilization. Something that I think about is just prosperity itself and how that changes community. Because community is hard. I mean, I'm, I'm an advocate. Uh, I mean, Robert Nisbet is a significant thinker in my life. Uh, but I recognize how hard they are, how hard family life can be how you know, the people closest to us can be hard to deal with. People have those experiences. Another way of thinking about this and get your reaction, prosperity, a welfare state that it, that it underwrites, sort of makes individualism fun. And, you know, we can kind of have community on the cheap when we want it. So let's, let's think about that for a little bit. I mean, so the great thinker of individualism uh, that I turn to when I think about this stuff is Alexis de Tocqueville. Mm. And he saw America as one of the, you know, there's no inherited rank in America. And the idea that the individual heart is kind of the standard of justice and where the good life will be lived, self-interest rightly understood, he called it, is the, is the moral center. So he recognized the individualism of America. And the investigation that he undertook is, well, why did America not fall for the idea that uh, individuals are better off alone? And his answer to that was, I think, had, had several aspects to it. But one was that Americans were almost all raised in families in an environment where that was expected and honored. And there were strong roles for men and women. Another aspect of it was that Americans would get together for civil activity, um, but, you know, they were prepared for that because they had already learned to kind of sacrifice and live beyond themselves in families. But they would get together in civil associations to accomplish great things. It was more powerful when people banded together, and therefore government didn't have to become very powerful. And so I think really at the root of the whole way of teaching individualism or enhancing the purview of the individual for Tocqueville was family life. And I think Americans understood that for the longest time, uh, really only until the powerful ideologies that we're talking about here became prominent in the American landscape did the Tocquevillian synthesis or the way of improving individualism fall apart. And the argument was that community is hard. Family can be oppressive. Uh, mm -hmm. Family can yeah. be the source of great disappointment. Yeah. And there is, some, there is something true about that. So let's throw out the bathwater and the baby went with it. And, and the, oh, and the babies went with it. I'm going to have to use that somehow in the future as a tagline. But well, I think too, I mean, I think about that a lot. Yeah, family can be oppressive. It can be a source of disappointment, as you say. But then the, the question is, what are you going to replace it with? And yeah. as, as we look to say, Countries in Europe, which I, I think socially are, you know, a generation typically ahead of America. The answer is not much. <laughs> I don't I mean, a, a large welfare state, uh, individualism, creature comforts and, you know, things like that. It, it seems to me that's not the most satisfying way to live. And yet, you know, th there it is. A question for you, too. You mentioned Tocqueville. I mean, that was something I was going to bring up. Is this... You know, you've got these ideologies in your book that you describe. Is this, is it that, or is it just something, maybe this isn't opposed to it, but is it just democracy itself leads us towards egalitarianism, leads us away from these sorts of arrangements where people are sort of marked out to do particular things, and it just sort of, democracy over time just sort of flattens us. And you're right, Tocqueville pointed to things he thought that would make America stand out, but it's just sort of this slow process that we're going through, and I don't know how it ends. Yeah, I mean, that's something I think deeply about too, Richard, because the whole decline of family life and marriage do seem in some way to be the working out of the liberal principles of liberty and equality, which are right there at the beginning. And uh, is there no stopping point for these particular principles. We can understand equal protection of the laws or equal treatment of the laws, but you know, feminism takes that same principle and says that there needs to be equal outcomes between men and women, 
if there's going to be a just society, but it's still the principle of equality. How can we find a limit on equality, stop it from becoming equal protection and becoming equality of results? And do those qualifications on equality have to come from outside of liberalism? And I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, They have to come from outside of liberalism. So liberalism is friendly to those things that come from outside of it. Mm -hmm. It's friendly to the idea that some limits on equality will make human beings happy, will make them better, will make for a self-governing community better, will make people more civilized. So, you know, liberalism is open to those qualifications. So what I try to spend a lot of time doing is showing ways in which we can leverage the resources within human nature, within public opinion still, so that we can, you know, ratchet back uh, some of the aspects of the rolling revolution. But whether or not I'm hopeful that those things will be accomplished is another matter. You know, one question is, I mean, this sort of, when we think about immigration policy in Western countries, I mean, there's the sort of, we roll off this statement that, uh, well, we need it. We need more immigration because of demographics, aging demographics, not enough children. And so we have to have immigration. Well, and I understand that argument. I guess I always tend to think in the back of my mind, well, what does that mean about us, though, that we need people in many cases, you know, in Europe's case, you've got people from a different civilization coming in, which is going to inherently bring problems. But I think that's a question I have. Isn't there something wrong with us profoundly? I think about that question a lot, too. And uh, one of the things that I went and wrote for uh, Law Liberty uh, about a year ago was an analysis of an old book, Christianity and Classical Culture. Mm. And I looked at what was happening in the Roman Empire, right? you know, because people recognized it was kind of falling apart. And the things that characterized that falling apart were steadily declining birth rates, the desire to integrate whole classes of people from outside of the empire within the empire, that is, to become Roman citizens, the barbarians in this particular case. And I think all of these things kind of go together. Declining birth rates, failure to marry and uh, live for beyond the short term, decadence, political decadence. We call it progress because it's progress in the rolling revolution. But I think all of these things are ultimately signs that civilization is teetering on the edge of collapse and that the society has become decadent. And it's really hard to imagine, you know, and people send me a lot of articles because I write a lot in public these days. And just in the last two days, I've gotten articles like father wants to marry daughter, adult daughter from the New York Post. Uh, There was an expose about a new kind of pornography. I can't remember its name, but uh, you can own your own pornography and become your own agent uh, instead of having to use something like Pornhub uh, as a middleman. And, you know, these things are all really celebrated. It's really hard to imagine that any healthy political community would celebrate what we celebrate. We can only really understand what's going on there in terms of, like, it's the next role in this revolution that's been going on. But as a civilizational principle, something that you can imagine lasting 100 years or 50 years, it's difficult to see these ideologies as very fruitful. You know, I think one of the leading edges in our understanding of political decadence is this collapse of family life. Another indication of it is the fact that we're willing to make up for it by importing new people into the political community. Historically, that's never led to health. And luckily, no one knows anything about history anymore, so they can't talk about Rome. (laughs) You know, the point has been made, too. You know, America was sort of up until, I think, 2008, from things that I've read, uh, we had a positive birth rate largely, I think, because of of new immigrants. And now we don't. Part of that, you know, the the pandemic is working and then the financial crisis in 2008. And I don't think they've ever really recovered, though, in the last decade. And something people will say is, well, people who are newly arrived to this country aren't having children the way that we expected. And And I tend to think to myself, I guess, you know, we have a faster acculturation process maybe than we thought. The modern liberal state, as you think of, I mean, there are a lot of people conservatives turning against liberalism broadly. Do you see the modern liberal state being the problem necessarily, or is it 
not necessarily that. It's it's. I, I mean, and I guess maybe this question answers itself with your idea of the rolling revolution. But could it just be if we? So if we did have a classical liberal state, could we just sort of put these things to the side and say, well, the state's not really going to be concerned either way. It's just going to focus on basic tasks. Would that be a better way to go and just sort of try to get out of all of these cultural war scenarios and let private institutions work? Yeah, I mean, there's good solutions and there's less bad solutions. And so the way I would kind of rank them is that a state that's actively trying to break up the family is worse than one that actually takes a night watchman's approach and doesn't do that much damage. Um, I still think there's a real limit on what can be accomplished uh, under such a state. But the, the situation to be in is one where the state favors a kind of indirect support for an enduring marital form between a man and a woman. So perhaps we'd want to work toward limits on divorce. There would also be a culture that would be shaped through regulations that would limit things that are hostile to married life. So once again, we talk about limits on pornography, but also things like limits on maybe adultery can be a crime instead of just a civil matter. And and this was the old way of approaching these matters. And I think there's wisdom in these old ways. I don't think they could be accomplished in the same way, but the, the general tenets of the liberal state are that the state should favor a particular kind of marital form, and the state should be interested in cultivating an environment where people are more likely to marry and stay married. And, you know, those are things that can't be really thought of in terms of just retreating. Mm -hmm. But retreating is obviously better than active hostility. If we think about states and localities had, throughout most of American history, a very strong moral police power. And so things like adultery were, in many cases, illegal. Uh, I mean, many things were proscribed that if people knew about it or, when, or if they're told about it, they sort of they can't believe it. And the idea being that it was this was an attack, it would undermine the family, and that would undermine community and social and political order. I guess that's not something people now are going to agree with. But I, as I think about that, I mean, it's, you know, a libertarian idea is, well, let's just get the state completely out of all of this stuff. Easier said than done. But I, and I ask that question, too, as a... Do I see, I mean, we have people would point to, you know, we have a government, you know, that just recently passed uh, policies that the Biden administration for the next year, I think, is going to pay every family uh, with a combined income under $150,000 a year, you know, a monthly payment per child. Can you confidently say that, say, federal government and state governments undermine family life, or is it more of a, just a cultural and social choices people are making? Yeah, I mean, I think I could constantly say both. Okay. So, I mean, when, when you look at things like sex ed, which is now kind of a pre-K thing in some states, uh, certainly there's pretty radical agendas uh, in all states. We're just actually having some of that uh, come up here in Idaho, where there is a pretty radical sex ed curriculum in the public schools for first through third graders, where it's a family show, so I won't uh, discuss exactly what's going on in that curriculum. But I will say that one of the representatives was going to read from the state house floor what was in the curriculum, and she was ruled out of order because it was indecent, Mm, And which is a great irony. And basically, that's just the next role in the revolution is the sexualization of children. Now, that is happening in the culture. There's no doubt about it. You you can see that in commercials and uh, television shows and uh, probably teen magazines and things like that. But it's also an intentional government ambition, and uh, it's happening all over the country, and they're moving in tandem, so probably even coordinating their actions. And so I don't think that either of them exists in the absence of the other, but the, the important thing that you're talking about there is that just limiting what government does is probably not going to save as much as you'd hope, but it does give parents more space to operate if government isn't you know, actively undermining things. So as I say, the first thing is do no harm and then see if you can do good. And uh, so just removing government from sex ed would be a kind of neutrality. It's interesting that no matter how much we co- confess that we're a liberally neutral political community, 
We haven't gotten government out of the sex ed business. It's gotten more and more into it, trying to do a sex ed in a neutral way, but obviously peddling a sort of morality to the youngsters who are in there. And parents have to do a lot of counteracting. So, you know, I I think the the framework you're setting up is a good one, and we should recognize that both of these elements of the law and culture are working in tandem uh, in the same direction. Uh, Interesting to think about there. You know, Indiana proscribes any sexual education in the government schools here. I mean, think about the homeschooling rising. Now we've got this interesting article I was reading on these hybrid homeschools, too, that have sort of spontaneously formed classical schools that have formed. I mean, is it the case, too, I think people have already just, many people are trying to exit and have exited and are just trying to build again. Is that sort of, I mean, that that seems to me also a solution that sort of, I I guess, in my mind, the political battles have really gone nowhere. If you're thinking about these things, you're effectively painted into a corner. And maybe it's just the best you can build new institutions might be a much more, or, or part of a more effective response. Yeah, no, I I agree with that, with one qualification, that is, even these kind of carve-outs that people are seeking to build are part of America, and therefore they're infected uh, with the same, you know, aspects of the rolling revolution that the rest of America is. I mean, uh, what I'm hoping to do is, through the book, describe the various ways in which these powerful ideologies are shaping our lives unwittingly, even the enemies to some extent, of these ideologies accept some of their premises. And so that building new communities or trying to find ways out, first, is never going to be enough. It's kind of a short-term strategy, but it's also difficult because of the hegemonic nature of American culture to find a way out. So it's necessary, I think, in the long term uh, to gain back ground to try to win back institutions, try to f- identify institutions that are teetering and try to make them more solid. Uh, a retreat is obviously a losing strategy, so there needs to be selective offensiveness uh, to, in order to win one's own space to kind of live a life. Scott, I, I think that's a good way to conclude. We've been talking with Scott Yenner, the author of The Recovery of Family Life. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Richard. This is Richard Reinch. You've been listening to another episode of Liberty Law Talk, available at lawliberty.org.